Well, welcome everybody. Hopefully you're here for CS 468. Uh, this course is Differential Geometry for Computer Science. Uh, my name is Justin Solomon, and I'll be one of your instructors. Uh, Adrian Butcher is the other instructor, and he's <laughs> kind of in the back, fussing with the video camera. But uh, anyway, sorry about that. But before we get started, uh, I have a couple of administrative things about the class itself, and then we'll uh, dive right into some content for the day. Uh, so I guess we already introduced ourselves, but I'm Justin Solomon. My contact information is here. Uh, so Adrian will be teaching approximately every other lecture, um, and then we'll be holding our office hours directly after lecture. This course has a CEA, uh, Diana Lee, who unfortunately I think couldn't make it today, uh, but she'll be here starting the next class, and she'll announce her office hours online soon. Um, this course has a web page at cs468.stanford.edu, which is where we're going to post all the homeworks, all the interesting materials, links to papers potentially, and so on. Um, in addition, I've set up a Piazza page. I think, how, how many people in this room have used Piazza before? Uh, let me rephrase that. How many people in this room have not used Piazza before? All right, uh, well, it's pretty straightforward. Go to piazza.com, search for this class, and uh, we'll use it for posting announcements, you know, having discussions and questions and answers and, and all the usual things that we have on the course bulletin and board. Uh, our expectations in CS468 are pretty straightforward. We're going to have four homeworks that will be approximately once every two weeks. Uh, the first homework actually is already uh, there for you and we'll cover the material from the first two weeks. And then we'll have one sort of, I think, smallish final project uh, which basically will involve picking either a technique that we've discussed in this class or a related one from the set of uh, geometry processing, differential geometry uh, algorithms and actually implementing it and, and, and doing a little bit of analysis to tell us if it works as advertised and, and, and so on. And then finally, uh, one aspect of this class that we're going to try is that with each lecture except for today, we're going to ask that one student be sort of a scribe and take a set of notes. Uh, your, your notes we do, I guess, a week after the lecture that you've signed up for. And there's a sign up page on, uh, on Google spreadsheets that you can access from Piazza. Um, and we ask that each student sign up for a different lecture to be the scribe for. We don't need a bunch of notes from the same one. And then what we'll do is once we receive your notes, assuming that there's nothing, I don't know, inappropriate in them, we will uh, we'll post them on the course web page to share with everybody so that we can uh, document what went on, what went on in lecture. Uh, by the way, uh, you'll probably notice from the homework in the back that the homework is pretty challenging. Um, you should know this is, first of all, the first time we've taught this course, so it takes a little bit of triangulation. But it's also intended to make you guys think. The background for this class is only Math 51. Um, and the notation, or I'm sorry? Ah, uh, math 51 and 52. Actually, that's 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 important because it'd be nice if you've seen surfaces before. But uh, some of the notation that you see in the homework is something you've certainly seen in math 51. I took math 51 a long time ago, but uh, it might not be something you've practiced ever since. So expect, especially the first homework, to be a little challenging. But do come to office hours, get help, post questions. Um, we're all we're all here for you, and uh, hopefully. We'll all make it through, and and I think it'll be it, it's very interesting, and we'll help you learn a lot. So the structure of 468 uh, is that we'll alternate between a theory lecture and sort of a discretized lecture. So the theory of differential geometry has been around for hundreds of years, at least aspects of it, and certainly without some understanding of how all of that works, you can't possibly expect to understand the discrete side, uh, uh, which is a much more recent development within the last decade or two. Uh, so for the most part, Adrian, who's our, our resident mathematician, will be giving the uh, nice, rigorous theory lectures, and then I'll be coming in behind him and giving very hand-wavy, you know, discrete lectures about the algorithms and things that are involved that, that you can formulate uh, that adapt to these, these theoretical concepts. So does anybody have any questions about uh, how CS468 is going to go procedurally, any questions about homeworks or projects, so on. Yeah. For, the, for the, the notes, do you require the use of like LaTeX or something like that? Yes, uh, if you've never used LaTeX before, which is you know a math typesetting thing, this is a great learning opportunity because all mature mathematicians should use this eventually. Uh, 
Yeah. Do we require it? If it's a real torture to use LaTeX, then maybe we'll come up. You, you, no, you have a good alternative. Right. Your, your uh, document had better look as, uh, yeah, just, as nice as the We're sharing the notes with everyone, so they should look, they should look good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I expect it to be just a couple pages and, you know, full sentences and, and maybe some, some diagrams to show what's going on in the lecture. Remember, we're teaching a geometry class, so diagrams are really useful. Um, and if you want, you can probably borrow some from the slides and so on. We'll, we'll post on the course book page. Any other questions? Great. So I thought before we went too much farther, just for our own sake, it would be useful to do a quick show of hands kind of survey. Don't be shy. We're, again, the background that, that we expect is what it is. But how many students in here are, are undergrads? Cool. Master students? And PhD? And I guess uh, beyond? There you <laughs> Cool. So it's about an even split. And, and in terms of what department you guys are in, computer science, math, uh, engineering, more generally, elsewhere, art? No. Every once in a while we'll get an art student. Uh, cool. So that sort of concludes our administrative stuff. So let's, let's, let's go into some content for 468. Today's lecture will probably be a little short. So again, uh, remember that I mentioned that our class is going to happen in sort of two parallel threads. The first one is all about continuous differential geometry. Uh, this is sort of calling differential geometry continuous differential geometry, I think, is an invention of the discrete land to help differentiate it from the other half of this course. But basically, what we'll be talking about here is the, uh, you know, the, the theory of differential geometry from sort of classical theoretical perspective, with obviously with a little bit of an eye toward what we're actually covering in this class uh, algorithmically. Uh, these images, by the way, are the covers of a very famous set of differential geometry textbooks that are very cute. If you look at them, they, they, they tell a little story related to gauss Binet. Anyway, so probably the area of different, or rather of geometry that's almost 100% familiar to most of the people in this room is Euclidean geometry, right? There's a uh, a very famous uh, piece of literature from a very long time ago, right? Euclid's Elements, which is, uh, constructs some of the basics of geometry starting from, from these, these building blocks, right? Line segments and circles and so on. Um, you can see that, that this literature has persisted uh, uh, for a number of years and probably into your high school geometry class curriculum. Um, but if we take a look at the figures that show up in your typical Euclidean geometry textbook, at least circa 1700, you'll see that they're not humongously interesting relative to the types of shapes that we see in everyday life, right? In fact, if you, this is just a random set of pages that I got from downloading from like JSTOR or one of these, these you know, journal scanning things, and you can see that basically we have triangles, circles, and lines. But in more modern geometry, we have to deal with shapes like brains. And unfortunately, it's hard to take this big confirmation of all of these folds and smooth bends up and down and so on. Singularities are happening, uh, different pieces. And how do we take that and describe it in the context of circles, points, and lines? And unfortunately, this isn't entirely obvious. So one of the, uh, the many fields that became invented to help us deal with this is the field of differential geometry. Differential geometry is all about the study of smooth surfaces, things that are curved in various ways, um, so that we can understand their shape both locally and uh, see their global structure. Um, of course, the main question that you guys should ask, and, and probably the mathematicians in this room already know the answer, and, and maybe some computer folks do as well, but what exactly is a smooth surface? I think is a question that we have to answer before we can get any farther along in this course. So if you were to start with Euclidean geometry, probably the, the sort of reasonable starting point for understanding a surface would be to look at something like the polyhedron. But this really isn't a great starting point. Right? If you look at the polyhedron in this image, uh, they, they, they aren't smooth at all. Right? In fact, if you think of your high school calculus standpoint here, the surface is perfectly uninteresting. Right? There's a bunch of flat panels here. And then they're joined up at these little singular pieces, and it's very hard to explain this in terms of the language of sort of smoothly varying objects. So we need an entirely new language to understand how continuous smooth shapes work. So instead, I think that it's probably easier to resort to the language of calculus. 
So we might not know what a smooth surface is, but certainly something that you guys have all seen before is how do you define a smooth function? Right? So first of all, what is a function? Well, it's pretty simple, right? Take a uh, point x on the number line downstairs, and for each point x, you're going to map it to some point f of x, right? Usually we think of f as sort of a graph where this, this direction is x, this is f of x. And then what does it mean for a function to be smooth? Well, in mathematics, we have this term called c infinity to describe a smooth function, okay? Which says that we can take as many derivatives as we want, and that each derivative is continuous along the curve. Right? So if, it's, uh, if a function is c infinity, that means that we can measure its slope, its acceleration, its, what, its jerk, I guess, is the, uh, the derivative after that. And each one, no matter how many times we do this, continues to be uh, well behaved. Right? This is quite different from sort of the starting blocks of uh, the Euclidean geometry, where you have these axioms involving basic shapes. Okay? So, is a smooth surface somehow just a graph of a C-infinity function? Well, actually, the answer is not quite. So there's a little bit of divergence from just the basic calculus that you're probably used to from high school. So in particular, you've probably seen this example somewhere. Certainly, if you took uh, CS 348A last quarter, you have seen exactly this example. But uh, let's consider these two functions below here. And so both of these are uh, parametric curves, right? That means that it takes one number t and then maps it to uh, two numbers that describe a point in the plane, right? So the usual parametric curve that we all know and love is uh, cosine t sine t, which everybody knows gives what? Circle, yeah? Um, but let's say I want to trace out this, this line here, y equals 2x. Well, the usual way that I can graph a function, right, is I could put, uh, for x I can put t, right, the parameter that's sliding along the x-axis, and for y, I can put 2t. Obviously, it's pretty clear here that y equals 2x. But this is not the only parameterization of this curve. For example, I could, I'm not really sure why, but I could, for t less than or equal to 1, I could have our usual graph here. And then for t greater than 1, I could have this other linear function here. And it's pretty easy to double check that these two objects trace out the same curve. Intuitively, what's going on? Well, I'm driving my... Uh, you can think of this as I'm, I'm driving my car along the surface here, and at point, uh, I guess, 1, 2 here, all of a sudden my car jams on its accelerator, it doubles its speed, right? So there's a uh, velocity discontinuity in this, uh, in, this, in this parameterization here. So my question is, is this thing still a smooth curve? Well, from, from the, the standpoint of high school calculus, this is not necessarily a differentiable function, right? At t equals 1, your speed just doubled, right? You have this sudden uh, hit in the accelerator and your car zooms off. But did that affect the shape of the curve? No. So uh, our definition of a smooth surface is just a graph of a uh, smooth function already seems a little bit questionable, right? In particular, I've come up with an object that seems perfectly smooth, right? It's a straight line. And I've found a graph for it. That, that doesn't have this nice C-infinity property. So you say, okay, well, Justin, maybe this is easy to deal with. So maybe what I should do then is say, okay, well, a smooth surface, or in this case, a smooth curve, is an object that admits something like F1, right? So that is, yeah, so you came up with this weird thing where your car jammed on its accelerator, and now we have discontinuity, but as long as there exists some way to parameterize this object that is smooth, we're going to call it a smooth surface and move on with life. But it turns out that still isn't quite enough. So uh, the main thing to get so far is that by changing our parameterization around, we haven't affected the way the curve looks, but we're still not entirely sure that this covers all cases for surfaces. So let me give you another kind of perverse little example here. So let's say that I have this function f of t, where now, you know, so far all of our examples have put t in the x slot and then some other function in the y slot, right? That, that generates a graph. But now, let's say that we have our x is t squared and our y is t cubed. This is a perfectly legitimate, parameterized, nice function, right? And when I graph it out, as uh, Wikipedia kindly has provided for me here, what happens? Well, everywhere away from the center point, it does indeed look like a nice, well-behaved, smooth curve, right? But at time t equals zero, we have this little pointy object here. 
Now, will we consider this curve on the left to be a smooth curve? Probably not, right? If I hadn't handed you this nice, smooth-looking polynomial function that, that you see on the right-hand side, if you looked at that, you'd say, no, that's most certainly not smooth, right? I don't have any sort of tangent here. Um, we just have this little, this little pointy piece that we have to be able to deal with. But our function f is perfectly smooth. So what happened here? Well, basically, if you take the first derivative at time 0, right, you'll get 2t and then 3t squared, right? And we put in 0 here. And the first derivative is exactly 0. So if we think of t as time, and my car is driving along this curve, right? What happens when it reaches this cu cusp here? Well, my, cur my car is slowly jamming on its brakes until it comes to a complete stop, right? And then the car can pivot any way that it wants, and then keep driving off in another direction, right? So together, what do these two examples show you? Well, the first example shows you that it's not quite enough to just require um, that it be the graph, you know, that, that, it's, that a surface or a curve is smooth simply uh, if and only if it's given by the graph of a smooth function, right? But the, the only if also isn't great either because we can have these bizarre cusp objects. So we need to be very careful about the way that we define and understand surfaces in this class. So what can we say about a surface? Well, oh, and for, uh, pardon me, and further, before we go on, uh, yet another question we can ask is we can say, okay, does the surface have to be the graph of a function at all? Well, let's say that I give you this object here with two holes in it, and I ask you, okay, so so far I've been able to give you an f of t, right, that traces out the curve as a function of time. But what if the f of x comma y, right, is a surface instead of a curve, that yields this weird object with two holes? Uh, I certainly can't think of one. Um, I'm pretty sure one doesn't exist, certainly not one with nice properties. But uh, uh, it would be convenient for us to be able to describe this object's geometry independent of the way that we graph it. So what can we say about a surface? Well, we can say one thing, which is pretty clear, which is that a surface is a set of points, and, and, and for our purposes in this class so far, it's a set of points that's embedded in free space. What does this mean? Well, we have this, uh, I guess you call this a double torus. And, uh, well, all it is is some very small set of points that's sitting in three space. Very small set of points. What do we call three space, by the way? We can call this ambient space, right? This is the space that this 3D object is sitting in. Yeah? But obviously, there are lots of sets of points in three space that are not surfaces. For example, if I filled in the interior of this double donut here, Right, then it would move from being a surface to being a volume. Right, it now has a uh, has, has stuff shoved in the inside of it. So we're going to need a little bit of additional information. So thankfully, we actually can still resort to high school calculus to help guide us a little bit here. So one thing that at least certainly my generations of students have uh, played with for hours and hours and hours on end is the TI-83. And I managed to find a screenshot. Actually, I think this is from the TI-92. Apparently, 83 doesn't even uh, you know, exist anymore. But uh, one of these big keywords that you see in high school calculus class is the phrase local linearity. Right? How many people have heard this one before? Right? You pretty much guess what it is if you take calculus, even if you haven't heard the phrase. Right? And the, the basic idea here, right, and you've no doubt explored this on your TI, which is that you can graph some weird function, like this one, 